Hello, I'm Roger Bisbee. In this video, I want to talk to you about inventions and actually about mad inventors. Not all of them mad, obviously, but it just so happens that a few of them have been what I might call a little unhinged. It's alive! It's alive! I used to work for a building trade magazine. Long before Dragon's Den, people would come to see me with their invention, with the idea of giving it the oxygen of publicity. So I didn't go in for that Dragon's Den approach, that ritual humiliation where you make them stand in front of you like a naughty schoolboy and you ridicule them. I never thought that was a good idea. I thought anybody that had the guts and the energy to invent something deserved a fair hearing. This is a problem because a lot of the time, if you look at an invention and you say, that's not very good, they're not going to be happy about you saying, I've seen it, mate, but I don't think it's got a hope in hell. Very often they would cite the case of people that turned down the Beatles, a person that rejected the Black & Decker workmate. It's almost like the more you turn them down, the stronger and more determined it made them, which is obviously a very good thing, but it can also be a bad thing. Oddly enough, one of the categories of building trade guys that used to come and see me quite a lot, probably disproportionately so, was bricklayers. And I put this down to the fact that they're doing a repetitive job all day long, and after a while you get into the groove, you don't have to think, so it frees up your mind, run out of all the other thoughts in your head, you start coming up with inventions. Squid they would not be necessarily inventions about bricklaying. What they would generally be about is other people's trades. They would see somebody else doing a job and they go, I've got an invention to make your job easier. If you haven't actually done the job, you won't know about the good reasons that there are for the job being done in that way. So the bricklayers would come along, they would give up their day job almost, and they would put on a suit and they would grab a briefcase. You would see them walking around the halls of trade shows, trying to get five minutes of time with anybody. Do you want to see my invention? Sometimes it was good, most of the time it wasn't good. The biggest problem was that because they got this invention, they're worried about being ripped off. They would hold this thing very close to their chest. They didn't want to lose any control of the inventions. They would try to take care of the production, the marketing, the distribution, all those areas where they had no track record, no expertise. They had no way of levering their way into the distribution network, into the builders, merchants. And of course, it's a very soul destroying thing. And when they started taking out loans for those inventions, things got even worse. They would come to the magazine and the magazine would be only too happy to take £3,000 from them for an advert and that wouldn't do particularly well for them. And if it did, they hadn't got the distribution worked out, spent a lot of money, got a second mortgage out in their house and very often fell out with their partner, with their wives. Sometimes I'd even seen them getting divorced. I came to the conclusion that a lot of them would have been better off if they'd never invented that thing. If that little thought had never entered their head and they just carried on laying bricks, they would have been a hell of a lot better off. But of course you cling on to these ideas, you know about tenacity, you know about sticking in there. If it happens, that's fantastic. But more often than not, it didn't happen. And then of course we come to the other problem, which is the patent because a lot of them were very, very keen. I've got this invention, I wanna tell you about it, but I've gotta get a patent on it, and then you've gotta sign this non-disclosure agreement. On Skill Builder, we're still getting people contacting us with these inventions, and some of them are good, some of them are bad. When they say, I've got a patent, the first thing I say to them is, okay, so how much money did it cost you? It's quite a bit, but you know, they're willing to do it. They've got faith in their invention. What happens when somebody infringes your patent? Because if you've got a good invention, it's not gonna be long, before somebody is coming along with a Chinese knockoff. This happened with the Australian fellow that invented the Rufus, lovely little square, and he spent years perfecting that, like 20 different prototypes he manufactured, got it into market, he wanted to recover his investment costs, he got that on sale for about 50 quid, and then the Chinese came along and made one for eight quid. So of course he starts fighting them, he starts closing them down, and as soon as he closes one down, another one opens up. Now that 
Chinese knockoff is nowhere near as good a quality as his. But a lot of people don't see that. All they see is a cheap deal, go and buy the knockoff and that'll do the job. So fighting those patent infringements is a very costly and time consuming business. And it's a little bit like firefighting. You know, you put the fire out there and then you see it sprung up again there. You go over there, you put that fire out and then you see that one sprung up again. If you're going to fight these patent infringements, you can lose your house. Pretty bad thing. I think in some ways we're missing out because a lot of entrepreneurs are finding it's just too cumbersome, it's too expensive for them to go fighting these patents. There's no real backing from the government. So I mentioned that I'd spent 30 years writing for the trade press and I just want to tell you about a few of the failures and successes that I've seen over the years. Some of the things that I thought were good that never made it to market and some of the things that I thought weren't good that actually ended up making a fortune. I'm going to start with the ladder seat. And I first came across this guy sitting there at a trade show, not selling any. And I thought that's a great invention. I'd buy one of those. I tried it, I sat on it, totally convinced it's a lovely, safe, comfortable perch. And I bought one and I've used it over the years. We featured that on Skill Builder in our ladder safety video. So check that out. To me, it's a great invention. We got a lot of people who looked at that and said, oh, I wouldn't trust that thing. You wouldn't catch me on one of those. Well, that's because they've never been on it. If you actually sat on it, it would be a brilliant thing. That guy didn't succeed. He had a great invention, but because he wanted to distribute it, market it, do everything himself, he was manufacturing it in a garage, it failed. And there must be a load of those ladder seats sitting around somewhere and I'd love to buy them because I think they would be a winner. If he'd gone to somebody who knew what they were doing in the distribution and marketing, taken a smaller cut. If he'd got a fiver for each one and he had sold 20,000, he'd be better off than keeping 50 quid and only selling 100 or whatever. Another thing that I thought was really good, I hope Daniel Cox doesn't mind me saying this, but his roofing square, when he first brought that out, he put it out on Facebook. He got a load of abuse from people, from carpets, and go, oh, that's rubbish, we don't need that. Soul destroying that. When you wake up in the morning, you look at all the online comments and you just see people slagging it off, you start doubting yourself. Daniel stuck in there. When we started having an association with him, we put it onto Skill Builder and the sales started to pick up. And once people saw it and used it, and then started putting their feedback on there and saying, I got your square, it's a fantastically engineered piece of kit, does a great job and I'm so happy with it. The fact that it cost around about 100 quid wasn't really a problem because it's so well engineered that people were happy to have a quality bit of kit. And I think people have to remember that if you make something and you make it well, the world will beat the path to your door. Less successful, if you like, was the bricky. It's still around and it's a device for laying bricks. If you're not a good bricklayer, you can put the mortar in here, you can level the whole thing up and it gives you a perfect bricklaying job with no smudges, no anything. For the DIYer, for somebody who doesn't do a lot of brickwork, it's actually a very good device. But of course he was slaughtered by bricklayers. So it works a load of rubbish you're just encouraging amateurs because they felt threatened by it but they also quite rightly said that it doesn't teach people how to lay bricks that you don't go from using the bricky to becoming a bricklayer because you don't get to know how to put the mortar on and how to do the job cleanly. So I can understand that, but I think, you know, the bricky is one of those things that is good for DIYers, but not for trade. We now live in the world of a throwaway saw. And if you go into screw fix tool station, things like that, you will see the saws by the door, five quid. What Spear and Jackson decided to do, they got marketing guys in and had a look at it and they said, so how can we add value to the saw? They got a, a kind of an engineer sort of professor type. We want you to come up with a new design for a saw. We want you to do something wonderful because they gave him a load of money. And I met this guy. He said, I took the thing right back to, to basics. He said, I deconstructed the saw. Did it need to be made of metal? Did it need this? Did it need to be that shape? Basically, what he did is he answered all those questions. He rebuilt the saw as it was. And what he did is he came up with a device that he thought was going to just transform everything, which was a laser guide on the saw. Sharks with freaking laser beams attached. Press the little button on the top and it shot a line down, rather like the laser line you get on a chop saw. It showed you where the blade was gonna cut. You couldn't actually saw at the same time as you held the button down, drew a line on the timber, and you press the button on the top of the saw, you saw the line go down, you thought, okay, that's a good line. I thought it was a complete and utter joke. I said to the guy at the time, I really don't believe 
that this thing is going to catch on. And he said, why is that? I said, well, have you taken it out? Have you shown it to tradesmen? And he said, oh, I don't believe in focus groups. He said, you know, we're going to keep this close to our chest. We want a patent on it and all the rest of it. And he was afraid that people would nick the idea. So they kept it very close to their chest and revealed it in the open air. And of course, first thing that happens, you go out onto a building site with a saw, which has got a laser guide on it. You can't see the laser. And I said to him, that's great. You can use this saw in the dark. You can't use it in the daytime. I didn't want to condemn it out of hand because I feel some responsibility. I took this saw around on site and every single person that I showed this saw to just laughed and said, is this some kind of joke? Those saws, they had a warehouse full of them. You won't see them today, but they did try selling them in the UK and Europe and India and they tried selling them in Australia. They were good saws, but the laser brought nothing whatsoever to the party. So another failure was the Blade Runner from Jibrock Tools, and that was a device that was supposed to cut plasterboard. So they said, rather than using a knife, which is unsafe, we got this lovely device, you put a couple of wheels in it, you run it across the top of a bit of plasterboard and it cuts both sides of the plasterboard, just snap it off, wonderful. I took this thing out, took it around the country, showing various guys, few of them were polite about it, most people didn't think it was worth doing. They said, look, I can cut much faster with my knife, with my straight edge, you know, I'm a tacker. I need to get a move on. I can't mess around with this two-part tool and changing the cutting wheels. That was another one that was a complete flop that people spent a great deal of money promoting, developing, and unfortunately, it ended up in the bin. So here's another one that I take particular pride in, the rubber shroud that goes around the top of a bolster or a chisel to stop you whacking your knuckles when you're hammering away. Now, when that first came out, I took that onto site and I used it and guys around me were laughing their heads off. You don't need that, what are you, some kind of whip? They were thinking there was something macho about whacking your knuckles with a club hammer. And obviously, the, if you get more accurate and you do it enough, you don't whack your knuckles that much. But they did. They laughed about it. Everywhere I went, oh, I'd never use one of those. People called me a sissy. And of course, that's one of the things in the building industry. You have got this very macho attitude where people resist change and they think the old way, the hard way is the best way. It was really good to see that over the next couple of years, everyone started using chisels and bolsters with that rubber guard around to stop you whacking your knuckles. And of course, this is one of the problems with the trade press, because if you don't give the product a good review, the the magazine doesn't get the advert and the ad manager is then very upset. There was always that pressure to find the silver lining on any cloud, but I just couldn't on some of these inventions, hand on heart, I couldn't give it my blessing. And one of the ones that I saw was Decorator's Court, which famously sells at 99 pence a tube. Again, it's one of those price points that people find very difficult to lift off. And 99 pence a tube, who wants to pay any more for it? The manufacturers of this cork thought, we need to add value to this product. We need to lift it off that 99 pence and put it somewhere else. It was all about them trying to make more money and trying to come up with some unique selling proposition. It was more about them than it was about any need from the market to change anything. So they said, rather than using the skeleton gun, which people find awkward and they can't get a nice smooth line from it, we're going to put the cork inside an aerosol can and then you can just press the button and you can use it and it comes out in a nice smooth continuous line. We all know how you put decorators cork in, you just gun along with it, you get a wet rag or your wet thumb or whatever you do and you just run it down once and it smooths it off and that's the job done. And the other thing about the decorators cork in the skeleton gun is that you can look in the end of a tube and you can see how much is left in the tube. But of course, with this stuff, you've got it in the aerosol can, you shake it, you'd never know whether it was full up or not. You go along and use it, run out halfway through. And of course, that means if you're up a ladder or something like that, you've got to climb down, go and get a new one. So it was never, ever going to work. But of course, they put a lot of money behind promoting it. They bought a lot of adverts in the magazine and they tried to push this product. Now, here's another one that I knew or thought I knew that wasn't going to work. This is a guy, an electrician in Sweden, who decided that tradesmen weren't wearing trousers that were suitable for the job. They needed knee pads, they needed big pockets on the outside to put all their tools in. And he came up with some work trousers he used to go home. And in his spare room, he had a sewing machine and he would start sewing up these trousers with pockets on the outside. And they were the most ridiculous looking thing you've ever seen. And of course, he came over to the UK, he showed us these and I thought, how can I be polite about these? 
they looked absolutely ridiculous. You know, talk about village people. I just didn't think that his trousers would get worn by builders on building sites. I just said to him, you know, as politely as I could, I said, mate, I think you're wasting your time. Oh, I'm doing very well in Sweden with them. I said, yeah, but Sweden's not England. You know, it's a different thing. We're just not into that kind of look. You know, we, you won't do it. Those trousers now, Snickers trousers, have been copied by so many people. There are so many lookalikes out there, people that have taken that design and copied it, that I was so wrong. It was the most copied product I've ever seen in the building industry. It's a brilliant product. And of course, he went on from those original designs to create all these other trousers, specialist trousers, charge quite a lot of money for them, but they're good kit. I was really quite happy that I was wrong about that, but I would never, from the initial introduction to that product, have thought that it would be such a runaway success. I've got just as much chance of being right as flipping a coin in the air and seeing which way it comes down. That is the nature of inventing. So if you're an inventor out there and you want to contact Skill Builder, you want us to have a look at something, we will always look at things with a fair mind. We won't ridicule you, we won't laugh at it. We're going to be starting very soon a feature on Skill Builder, which will be products in a month where we look at new products, we look at things that people have sent in, and just rather than us give an opinion, we're just going to present them to you and let you decide whether you think they're a winner or not. So come back and see us soon. Look out for that feature, product of the month. It won't be Dragon's Den. It'll be a little bit different to that because we're going to be nice to people. So I've talked about the good inventions. I've talked about the bad inventions. But what I would say is that very few inventions turn out being right first time. In other words, you've got to fail better. You've got to get something out there into the marketplace. You've got to let people react to it. And you've got to think rather like Dyson does. He just keeps thinking, refining, refining, changing it and coming up with a new idea. You know, Dan Cox with the roofing square, got a lovely idea there, but I said to him, why don't you put the hips on there, Dan? Why don't you just put another scale so people can get the hips without going to your conversion chart there? And he said, oh, I don't want to do that because if I do that, all the people who bought the one without the hips are going to be fed up. They're going to be saying, oh, I wish I'd waited and got this one. And I said, Dan, if you think like that, you know, if Ford had thought like that, we'd still be driving around in Model T Fords. You've got to accept the fact that things change and if people want to buy a Mark II version, they will buy it. Don't be afraid to keep refining, keep developing, because that, after all, is how mankind progresses. That is a serious bucket of tea. Yeah. <laughs>